This is Paula Gloria. This is Farther Down the Rabbit Hole, and we're now on the final episode to explain how we can make binary economics actually happen, as uh, Aaron was saying, without scaring the heck out of people who own assets and are concerned about losing something uh, in order to empower the masses. And we have with us uh, Professor Robert Ashford, who is a professor of law at Syracuse, and also Aaron, who's known on YouTube as Blasting Caps. So I'm um, sorry we couldn't finish it in the last episode. Do you want to pick up from where we left off? Happy to do it. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, Aaron's asked an excellent question. H how do you explain this to people without scaring? First of all, the I have to again take my hat off to you because you ask all the great questions, and, and you're really tracking, and that's, and that's just a joy to my heart. Um, l let me say to you that that um, stepping back for a minute, one of the reasons why binary economics is not discussed is that if you look sort of psychosociologically at at capitalist systems, ownership is one of the great taboos. Ownership is not something that is generally talked about. Uh, uh, and for an owner to be confronted with the idea of sharing ownership, it's almost not polite. Do it. Yes. And it's yes. almost like they have to open up. They have to open up the right. subject. Ownership is not right. commonly thought of as an issue. For example, if you were to ask why are people poor, and look at all this, the funding that's done for why people are poor, and if you look at the uh, the studies done at universities, and if you look at all the, you know, people of course they don't work hard enough, they don't work smart enough, uh, people, or because capitalists yes. are greedy, or because. Yeah. Um, uh, Technology is taking jobs outside here, or I mean, there's a thousand different reasons. Nobody says people are are are, are people workers that don't own enough. I mean, right. you, just won't, you won't typically find that as right. a solution or as an issue. Yet it's obviously the most elegant I issue. The difference between the rich and the poor, the, the most consistent difference between the rich and the poor, is not education, is not hard work, uh, is 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 not. Um, uh, race is not the most consistent thing. Is that, is that the difference between the rich and the poor is the rich owe and the poor don't. That is a, that is statistically the one to one correspondence almost. Between, but but it's not talked about. But Robert, I I feel with binary economics, it's it's not that zero sum game that if I own less, or if if I own less, that's the only way for the other to own more. Oh, but the, but the perception is. That's a perception. You see, because going going back to something too programs ago, if the promise of the broader ownership in the future will not produce growth in the present, which is the binary principle that Adam Smith, Karl Marx, and John Maynard Keynes didn't see, if broader ownership in the future will not produce growth in the present, a corollary of that is that broader ownership in the future will take away ownership of those who have. Those two things are inescapably mathematically connected. It is only no, let me, let me recap to make this really solid. In other words, if you don't take into account that as time goes on and capital becomes more productive, then if you don't allow capital to be in the hands of the many, they will not have the capacity to buy the things that you need in the future because labor becomes more and more in, an insignificant aspect of the wealth that they need to buy the future products. Yes, and if there's no growth in the future, then broadening ownership amounts to taking from the rich. But if there is growth in the future, then broader ownership does not amount to taking from the rich. That's right. Do, do you follow that, Aaron? Yes, yeah. Can you, re can you recapitulate it just so everybody gets it, how you're seeing it? Well, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I'm, I'm thinking here, and I don't know if this is exactly the same way, but I was sitting here thinking that it, economically speaking, we're still listening to guys, you know, like you said, Adam Smith had already even seen a machine. We seem to have, like, constructed our uh, economic lives around ideas that uh, it's almost like we're driving a Model T Ford when we're capable of building Ferraris. That's right. That's exactly true. <clears throat> we, we, are, we, are, we are pretending that when you load sacks on a donkey, we are doing more work. Right. Right, right, right. A, and, and, and there's a fundamental dishonesty and, and, and lack of reality to that. We're pretending that as we shift more and more work from labor to capital, you can solve the income problem through jobs and welfare, and you can't. 
And you know what? It seems as though by not looking at that, that fundamental dishonesty is going to come back and bite even people at the top because the whole thing is going to run down. Well, uh, that I'm not sure of. I mean, it's possible. Uh, they're they're, they're the, sort of the catastrophe people. But, uh, but, but remember, when you, when you own all the apple trees, you can always, and, and, you, and your object is to grow slow. But the monopolist wants to grow slow so he or she can acquire it all than to grow fast if it means cutting other people in. That's, that's the, the cynical monopolist uh, point of view. So remember, there's a lot of power that they have to be able to, I mean, if people start getting hungry and demonstrating and, you know, storming the Bastille, you can always, you know, make some more apples. I mean, they, they, so I, I'm not convinced that, 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 uh, uh, that, at the, that the catastrophe theory is going to shake things loose. Yes, but what about this? How about the weaponry that we don't even know about? You see, the, well, again, the, I, I, the, the sites that are getting taken down off YouTube have to do with advanced weaponry, to, you know. And, and guess what, Robert? Since last week when I spoke to you, do you know what kind of sites are being taken down? Very straight sites that have to do with the markets. There, uh, you know, these older guys, there's no pornography, there's no copyright. They're just talking about what's going on in the stock market. These sites are being taken down. Well, all of so that that's a catastrophe. Again, my, I, 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 I'm not, a, I'm not a qualified to. I understand about those processes of change. I am. What, what I, what I think I can offer is, is side of things. Uh, if you were trying to, to uh, cause division, you would pump up what the left wing says about redistribution of wealth and welfare and things like that. And I, I think I think you're you're right about that. It's it, it's that whole divisionary sort of approach. The, 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 they are very happy to talk about state ownership of the trees versus um, let the capitalists have tax deductions so they can grow more trees or tax or, or shift more apples from the rich to the poor. But they don't want to talk about broadening ownership. The, the, the key to keeping, I mean, the reason binary economics is kept off the map, if from a conspiratorial point of view, is that it will enrich the poor without taking from the rich. Which, which is this is this is amazing because there is a there is some uh, obloviated egotistical rock star named Bono who had this uh, idea. I, I can't remember what happened. I'm sure it's still going on. But it was about, about eliminating poverty. And uh, <laughs> now, this, I'm going to be interrupting you. I know, but but let me just raise this question: Is it is the Aniga? I, I I have the feeling that if I could sit across from Bono the way I'm sitting across from you, and he saw it, he'd buy it. Oh, maybe. Yeah. If, no, no, if you want to change the world, let's get to Bono. Well, that well, that's what we're trying to do in producing this stuff to to alleviate the fear that the rich have that if they let go of something, they're going to lose. I want to show that it can be a gain, and I, I sense we can articulate that more, right? I think Bono's sincere, just to be, you know, uh, like if with that particular guy. I get your point completely. I understand. I mean, let's, let's, since, since you don't, I assume you don't know him. No. Okay. Or here's my, here's my suggestion. Let let us assume. Let us, assume, you know, Martin Luther King had a beautiful. We we're talking of strategy. Martin Luther King had a beautiful premise. Take take people at what they profess and hold them to it. Okay, so so, so so Bono and and Oprah and Ted Turner and you name them all, they all supposedly want to help the poor. Let's try to get to them. Right. And let let all the listeners that are listening to us that may know them. We're not going to judge them. We're not going to judge whether Oprah, who oh, ten yeah. years ago was talking about downsizing and looked into looked into the camera and said, "What is the answer? What is the answer?" Let's assume that she really wants to know what is the answer. You know, right. rather than I actually them, like that approach a lot right. better than being bitter. Yeah, right, let's, right, just, right. let's assume that everybody, you know, one percent of the people own fifty percent of the wealth. That you know, there there are four hundred some billionaires. There, you, you, my experience in life has been, if I could talk to, to twenty people, at least five of them are going to get this idea. I mean, Aaron, you got this idea. You you have enough of it that 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 it will probably, if if if, if I don't. At the risk of being presumptuous, it may change the way you analyze everything because that's that's its property. If I could get to 20 people with a billion dollars or 20 people with 50 million dollars, I could change the world. I have no doubt about it. Yeah. Right. But I can't. At least not yet. That's what Lewis Kelso felt that he could do because these were his clients. He was he was an attorney for very wealthy people. Well, um, and, and he would say when why when when 
he would ask, why haven't you succeeded? He says, well, we just haven't yet reached the right person and made it clear enough. And, you know, I want to further say, Aaron, I, I agree with you. Why be bitter? I think this is mostly a function of ignorance. I think very little conspiracy because I think there's a lot of wealthy people that want to do the right thing. They just, they're, they're ignorant about how to go about it. I'm, and, I'm and sure I think there are ways of appealing. And there are institutions, too. In, in, in New York, there, there, there must be a thousand institutions dedicated to poor working people. There must be an inter interreligious council that's involved with, with uh, you know, Christian and Je Christian Judaic and, and, and Muslim desires to help people. I mean, there, there, right. there's, there's plenty of institutions. Um, but again, they start with preconceptions. Look at I look at I see a familiar diagram on there. Right, I'm just worried we might run out of the third show time. Let's, let's let's talk about this diagram for a minute. And, okay. And, and remember now, first of all, you've already seen half of this diagram because you've got the corporation. Uh huh. You've got box two, the constituency trust, and you've got the lender. You've had those. We've already got three. We're just going to add three more uh, to the picture. And now, what I want to say just a couple of things about this. You know, one of the things that many people on the right and some people on the left say when they look at the economy is they say, a rising tide raises all boats. Everybody heard of that? Yes. Ever heard of that? You got that, Aaron, right? You've heard that before. What, what is it? A rising tide raises all boats. Uh, I've never heard it, but it makes sense to me. I, I can follow. People say that. Right. And a rising tide raises all boats. And, and, uh, and my only observation is, yes. But you need a boat, right? And the boat is capital. Without a rising tide, without capital, can leave an awful lot of people drowned and, and, and soaked with water. And so you need a whole boat. You need a boat. And then you've also probably heard the expression, "A half a loaf is better than none," right? Yes, I've heard. But you need, but a, but a half a boat is not better than none, right? You need a whole boat. Right. Three boxes that we had on the last diagram is, is a half a boat. And the six boxes we have on this diagram is a whole boat. Okay. And that's, and, and, and that's the picture that we have right now. And so what we have in this picture is we have six boxes, um, and um, we can read them across. What, what's been added is box four is something called a capital credit insurer a capital credit insurer. And that's somebody who provides insurance to the lender to enable the lender, which is the box over to the left of that one, to loan to the trust that enables the trust to invest in the company. You see, one of the things that Aaron asked was, how do you persuade the, the owner? If, if a loan is going to go to, comp to the trust rather than the company, because if you, then then the trust is going to end up buying the shares for its people. The existing owners would be asked to take a risk, because not all of these investments uh, pan out. Uh, sometimes you invest in something that doesn't pan out. Uh, in order for the lender to make the loan to anybody, whether it's rich or poor, you need two sources of repayment. That's standard banking policy. One source of repayment is the anticipated earnings of the new capital. And that's what, how much the, that the little hatch box will make in the future, and will it pay? Will it make enough of a profit to enable the lender to get repaid, whether it goes directly to the company or whether it goes to the trust and then the company? But the second thing that a lender needs is security if the if the loan fails to be paid off, and that security normally is in the form of collateral, and and when making a loan to a company. It's in the form of the shares of the existing owners. We don't have them on this graph. The existing owners are taking a risk if the company doesn't pay off the loan. They will, the bank will go after additional assets of the company. So the concept of capital insurance to ensure the risk of business failure is a institution uh, that needs to grow up within our economy. And it will grow up once people understand the principles we've talked about. Once we understand that a broader distribution of ownership in the future will make capital investment more profitable and safer, then the idea of capital credit insurance will begin to take root. And so that's what that, 
that by, if, if you could ensure the risk of business failure, then anybody could invest in business, not simply people who have existing ownership. You heard, you've heard another story. It takes money to make money. The truth is that it takes assets to secure credit to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. Okay, so let me make sure I'm with you it here. It roll off the tongue so, the same way, does it? No, it doesn't, but it's, <laughs> but it's, but it's more accurate. Right, right. Like okay, so Robert, so what, what this is, is if I want to get involved with a company, uh, I go to one of these insurance companies to say, can you ensure that if this company gives me shares in their capital, based on the earnings of the future capital, will you go for it? Will you insure, will you insure the will you insure? But actually, let me explain how, how the process probably would... Now, there are many ways to, to set up a binary economy, but I try, to set, I try to make a proposal that changes the things as they are the least. Okay. There, there, there are what, what are called, and I'm not going to explain them all, bottom-up strategies, top-down strategies, you name it. I, I look at it from the point of view of, of the six-box diagram, changing it the least. So here's how it, how, how it might work, if I may. Can you get back to the chart? I'm seeing the book. Okay, the chart. Right now, that, that, and, and I think it's, even though it's the, the small, I think it's better to, to look at the, all six boxes. Okay. Okay. Right now, this is a diagram both of a single company and all of America's 3,000 largest companies. It, 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 it re reflects the same thing. So think of this box one. Think of America's 3,000 largest credit-worthy companies. It's like, this, it's like Standard & Poor's Index plus um, uh, maybe another 2,500 companies. There's something called the Russell 3000 Index, which is that. Although you might not want to invest in apartment building because location, 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 you may not invest in a single company, there's not a rich person in the world, or at least in America, that is, doesn't have a diversified portfolio in America's 3,000 largest companies. If it's safe enough for the Rockefellers and the DuPonts and the Gateses and the Buffets, it's safe enough for mom and pop and you and me. So that, that's that, what that is about. Now, these companies have capital acquisition plans. They always have them. They can use retained earnings. They can borrow money directly from the company. They can sell stock. Here's the new way. They can include some of their employees, some of the consumers of their products, some of their welfare, some, some people who live by the plan, even welfare recipients they can include in this. Why would they want to do it? Because of the promise of broader growth in the future. Every one of these companies has unused capacity. So they would say to the lender, look, you're willing to lend to me directly. How about lending, lending to a constituency trust to enable poor and working people to acquire capital with their earnings of capital? Because after it's done, in the next period, there's going to be a much bigger demand for all of our products. So the, so the companies that have now understand binary economics say, let's loan to these. Now, the lender is going to say, well, we'll be glad to loan to the trust because we believe in the cash flow of the investment. But what about our security? Hang on just a second, Robert. I want to just clarify one thing. Sure. A bigger demand, I, let's say a bigger capacity to meet the demand, because anybody can demand it, whether they deserve it is a different thing. A bigger demand, here I'm using, you're right, you're right, here I'm using demand in the economic sense. I know, I know, but, the but we're not economists. Ownership right. In the future. Right. Will create more demand in the future, and therefore more demand to employ existing capacity, that's the part of the company that's not hatched, and more demand to build more of the hatched new, bird, new company. It does both. Right. Now, so the lender is going to tell the company that's now asking to loan to a trust rather than directly to the company, say, fine, I'll loan to the trust, but who's going to provide the security in the event of the fact that you make a mistake on this investment? And the company's going to say, well, not our existing shareholders, because they're not getting the growth potential of that new investment so much that we cut into the, the employees in. But how about a capital credit insurer? So the, so the l lender will say to the capital credit insurer, look, at, here's the company's plans. We think we'd loan to the company if the shareholders would put up their, their stock as collateral, but they don't want to do that. We think there is some promise to this broader ownership concept, but will you provide the insurance? And so that's that's that in, in, in additional company. Now, okay, so before, so hang on, hang on, first, hang on, just just a second, Robert. So so Aaron, this is the way that the company doesn't. How how is the expression that you said lose their mind or get frightened or freaked out? Well, the existing shareholders.
soldiers understand because they're not losing anything. Right, that, that, there, that there's an, that there's a that there's not they're not taking a, 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 an incremental risk. Right, it's done by the by the capital insurer, the I commercial think that's insurer. Where almost uh, maybe to a degree the linchpin is in getting this across to people is making sure that the people that do have uh, what others don't right now aren't don't get immediately freaked out. Right. The idea of that, that, you know, get the misconception that they're going to lose something instead of everybody, you know, gaining, you know, and, and things becoming just a little bit more uh, harmonious in between, you know, people in general. I think, well, I think, I think uh, you're right, Aaron, and I also think that, I mean, the insurance is a part of that comfort, comfort but I think ultimately there's even more I can provide that will, that will dis dis dissipate that fear. Let, right. let me do this. Let, let, let me say one more thing about this chart, and then we need to go down to the bottom chart and then come back. We to, one way of understanding what a binary economy would be like is to think of what we did with the Homestead Act. So, admittedly, the land was taken from the Indians, and I can't address fully that that moral issue. But when you talk about governments and you talk about private property, you're talking about what happens within sovereignty, not the clash between sovereigns. Uh, but uh, we have the Homestead Act, which was the idea of broadening land ownership. Right. And we have something called the FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, which provides people credit to borrow to buy homes. Before the FHA existed, in 1935, one-third of the people owned homes. Today, two-thirds of the people own homes. The difference is you had not only this box four, but you had a federal capital credit insurer in the form of the FHA. One way of understanding binary economics is just applying the principle of land ownership and insurance for home ownership to the industrial world and the, and the post-industrial world of the, of the 3,000 largest companies that all the rich insist on investing in for their own financial future. So in a way, this picture becomes less and less foreign when people realize there are precedents for it. But now, before I finish the, this discussion of the box, and we may not be able to do everything even in this hour, it may be worthwhile to go down to the last chart, on, which is right below there, and talk about that just a little bit. So that's a funny-looking chart, but, but, but I'm going to try to explain what that chart does. And, it, and you, it, Again, I think it's probably better uh, to see it. It's got years on the bottom. And it's got 7, 14, 21, in increments of seven years going out to 70 years. So it's sort of looking at a binary economy in what we call the long haul, um, long haul period of time. And <coughs> what, what this chart does is make an, a couple of very simple assumptions. It is, it, it is how, how a binary economy might look in the future, because that will address Aaron's question about the fear. There is something, if you stop it right there, where you can still see the seven, just move it up just a little bit. Move it, no, sorry, move it down just there. You go. That's good. That's perfect. That's about as good as we can do. There is something in business called a capital cost recovery period. It's the time that capital requires to repay it's investment. And so the idea is you invest in something, you build the tool, you employ it, it begins earning an income, and finally earns enough income to repay the cost of, of building it and, and all the costs of building it, including the labor costs involved in building it. This chart assumes a seven-year capital cost recovery period, that it takes seven years for that little part of the hatched box that we saw uh, to pay for itself. Oops. So that, that's what that assumes. So let <coughs> if we assume, it's a pure assumption, that X percent of America's 3,000 largest companies, some X percent of them, acquire Y percent, some, some percentage of their new capital acquisition in this way in the first year. So it's just a portion of a portion portion of the companies voluntarily, because they buy this idea, we've got through to them, invest a certain percentage, maybe, maybe they have a, a billion dollars, a hundred million dollars worth of capital investment, but just one percent, doesn't matter, some percent, X 
companies, invest, percent of the companies invest Y of the, in one year, and that the same thing happens every year. So that means up to the first seven years, all the capital is doing in that hatch box is paying for itself. But in year eight, one year's worth of capital is paid for itself. The first year is paid for itself. In year nine, two years' worth of capital is paid for itself. So in year eight, begin getting a dividend, some to employees, some to consumers of the products of the company, some to neighbors that live around the plants or the, 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 that, where these companies are situated, some even to welfare recipients. So you can imagine in year eight if a welfare recipient gets a dollar's worth of capital income because the capital is paid for itself. You can take that person 50 cents off the welfare rolls. The welfare recipient's ahead, but we've been able to lower taxes, and we can even give the company whose shares were involved in earning that part of the tax deduction or the tax credit for the fact that we've taken people off welfare. So welfare recipients begin spinning off welfare. Whatever happened in the first year, one year's worth of capital is paid for itself. In two years, twice as much. In three years, three years' worth of capital is paid for itself. So in year 14, seven years' worth of capital is paid for itself. In year 21, two-thirds, that's a 66 and two, Two-thirds of the annual acquisitions, just assuming a constant amount, no more, just a constant amount, it's basic assumption, it pays for itself. So over the long haul, the incremental productive power of capital, you know, read that to me, more horses, more uh, trucks, more machines, more airplanes, more whatever it is you're building, whatever it is you're building, is producing more, but now more and more and more of that distributing a higher portion of the capital income to people to employees, consumers, neighbors, welfare recipients, who are now beginning to demand more for the product. I'm just saying this chart provides a graphic understanding of how the system works systemically. Does that make sense, Aaron? To me, it looks like you have more people participating in the economy. By way of ownership, by way of acquiring way of capital with the earnings of capital, and then spending their capital earnings to soak up the unused capacity that we have today. And it also seems like good planning for the corporation because they're ensuring success that their product will be bought. A, a major, even and there is a, a side binary, you know, a lot of the people uh, with, who are with these corporate sense. reformers, uh, sometimes the problem the with Wall Street is that uh, just, close to they're only concerned with what happens next week. If he can't they're not get good enough right, the long haul. By selling binary his, economics will uh, get corporations company to think side buyer may end up selling because it. Once you understand uh, the importance to, to of the distribution of ownership, partly because they, they, maybe they think they can get a better price, right, partly for to a longer time frame. Can we finish this last chart, though? We never went on number yes, five. we can finish the last chart, but I think it's going to be the... <clears throat> so so box, five, box four is the capital credit insurer. Okay. That has to be on board. In order, in order to let the lender loan to the trust rather than the company and, and have the existing shareholders not shoulder the risk of business failure, the, company, the, the lender has to enlist the capital credit insurer. And okay. to have private capital credit insurance, we, we've learned from experience with the FHA, it helps to have a government reinsurer. And that's the dip block box. Okay, let me... Then we get to the last, the last part of this thing, which is probably the hardest to understand. And, and here, if a uh, you know, gentle viewer and gentle listener, if, if, if this mystifies you a bit, I, all I can say is that uh, the issue of, of, of central bank is a big mystery in and of itself. There are a lot of reformers that note that although, um, and this takes a bit of a lecture, uh, al although the right wing will complain about what they call printing press money. Right. It goes right, on all the right, time. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and a certain amount of printing press money is absolutely necessary if the objective of the economy is to, is to protect private property. So I bet that freaks you out then about Ron Paul. Well, you know, well, the difference. It does My mean. difficulty with Ron Paul is is in my same difficulty is with with the, uh, many many others. Is I don't think you can understand the pros and cons of monetary policy without understanding that capital and labor are independently productive, and that the broader distribution of capital acquisition will soak up unused capacity and promote growth. If Ron Paul understood that horses haul just as humans haul, and that the broader distribution of capital acquisition acquired with the earnings of capital will soak up unused capacity and promote growth, 
then he would begin to speak coherently about monetary policy. His well, problem is not that he doesn't understand that monetary policy is very important, ignored and obscured and, and mystified, and that, and that the public doesn't understand it. His problem is he does not understand the principle of binary growth. And if I could sit across the table from him, I'd be glad to explain it to him. Well, I am so but pleased. But nothing I'm in his work and nothing in his writing that explains this issue. Okay, I think we're going to have to wrap up our third show. I'm going to put it out, uh, you know, what we've accomplished so far. And uh, do you think we could meet again next uh, next Sunday or not at uh, 3 o'clock? No, I'm, I'm available again for next Sunday. Okay. Uh, the only thing I want to say to your readers and your listeners is that this is one medicine. You don't have to abandon all your other, other medicines. There are right. those people who say, we need immediate income right now, we need jobs right now, we need this right now, we need that right now. Fine. Don't abandon what you think you need right now. But don't deny this as being another important medicine to solve the problem. Absolutely. Well, I cannot thank you enough, both of you. Um, Aaron, do you have any final things to say? Uh, no, just that uh, Harold Channer wanted me to tell you hello. Okay. Uh, you, so. you know, Aaron, if you want, I know we're going off right now, but if you want to just spend a few minutes uh, uh, talking a little bit more about this, even though we're not on the air, I'm happy to do that. We don't have to. I can keep the tapes rolling. I just don't have enough for three shows unless we want to do the third, sh the fourth show. Well, I, I'm just wondering whether some some understanding. I mean, I'm happy to have the audience involved, but, but maybe there's some give and take we could do right now that would, in and of itself, serve something. That's all. Certainly, I have the tape. Let's let's keep going. Um, well, so. I, I, I'm I'm in a position now where I kind of feel like that, like like uh, like some things have been uh, made. Uh, questions have been answered I'm gonna have to go back and watch all this stuff again I haven't been able to see the chart as well because I'm far away from my monitor but uh, so I plan on going back and taking a look at all this stuff again and uh, sure. you know maybe taking some notes because I, I personally would uh, would really like to understand this uh, theory to, uh, to, to the extent where uh, I'd be able to explain it to other people because I, I don't, uh, as, as I, I'm fond of saying, uh, nothing's ever really, you know, uh, with the way we operate money-wise, it's never really sat right with me. I remember I was, I don't know how old I was, but my mother remembers this. She's the one who reminded me of it. Uh, at one point when I was a child, I pulled a $5 bill out of her purse and asked her why it was worth $5. She had no real answer, and I kept pestering about it until she told me to be quiet and put the money back in her purse. <laughs> That's a great question. Let me make two, one, two suggestions to you, uh, Aaron. Number one, and I make the same thing to Paula. Uh, you know, Her Harold Channer is sitting on copies of my book. Yes. You, in the, with, okay. uh, with Rodney Shakespeare. It, it, is, it is long reading, and, and for some purposes it's, it, it, it's slower than it needs to be. But, but as... As a, as a tool that would help you teach it, um, you know, he's sitting on these copies, and I, I already suggested to Paula take a copy. You both deserve a copy of this book. I, I have one copy here, so I he has it up in a in a box, so I will go over there and and get it out because he's already made a connection with uh, with Aaron. You need that. So number that's number one. Number number two, I was going to make a couple of uh, comments on on binary economics that you may appreciate, and then third, I'm simply going to invite you that uh, you, you've got my home number, just call me. I mean, you know, we, don't, we don't have to always have a TV uh, to, um, uh, to help your understanding. Because I'm convinced uh, that, um, you know, this understanding is no more complicated than eighth graders need to understand. It is really not that. It's, it's just been mystified. There's nothing right. really Say, can, can I suggest something, Robert? I, I think you're so generous with your time, but uh, they had something on Oprah where she was, through the Internet, reaching half a million people. I would really like to start something very similar with you because I think once people start to get that there's some big important thing for them to understand, I think you could have a lot of internet uh, viewers, and and we could you know have the benefit of of um, I just think everything you have to say should be recorded. Well, I'm happy to do that. I mean, there's no there's no uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, Aaron, let me just say a couple more things to you, and then, and then, um, you know, maybe we'll call it a day right now, because I did listen to most of the conversation with Harold Channer, okay, uh, and you, and I just wanted to make make a couple of points that will help you understand what is different about my approach. You'll also notice that, you know, that there's 
this guy, Norm Curlin, at the Center for Economic and Social Justice, and there's Rodney Shakespeare, my co-author, and there are many other people. That, that there are other people that champion this, but the, just to explain a couple of things to you. Uh, uh, Harold is, is, number one, very big on the idea of transcending scarcity, mm-hmm. and he's very big on that, and he believes, actually, that given, you know, uh, Bucky Fuller and all that, there's a particular day, time, and hour, and minute where yeah. we transcend the scarcity. <laughs> the only thing I want to explain to you about that, and I, and I have not fully gotten through to him, because uh, he has that as an independent sort of issue, right. is that the broader distribution of capital acquisition with the earnings of capital will promote growth, will soak up and use capacity and promote growth, whether or not we have transcended scarcity. It is a different issue. Okay. I mean, it's just an entirely different issue. Can uh, I ask, it, can, can you, could you explain how it, it would it seemingly naturally soak up uh, uh, the, 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 the wasted production? Well, um, unused. 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 Yeah. unused. unused. Let's suppose for a minute. I like wasted, too, though. Being, uh, a, a corporate planner with a Think of America's, any group of America's 3,000 largest companies, okay? Okay. Now, most, most American companies shut their doors at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. Or so. I mean, they don't, they don't run 24 hours right. a day. Most of those companies, um, and, and, there's, and there are unemployed workers that could work in every one of those companies. Suppose people had, could, could afford more. Those companies could work, could could employ their machines more and hire more people. Okay. If if we if we could just solve, if 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 we could increase the consumer demand immediately, if we could get uh, to, to its to its employees, yeah, so, partly because the, they, maybe they think they, they can get a better right, right partly for demand. idealistic right. reasons. Now. Their machines would run out a little bit, would wear out a little bit sooner. But most machines last longer than their technological life. I mean, we end up scrapping machines not because they physically worn out, but because someplace in some other foreign country where you're paying labor less and you're you're investing in you know more efficient, you know more modern machinery, right. out competing them. But the reason they so so can you see that that's unused capacity which could be solved. Yeah, it, the, the, I mean, when you put it when you put it in this in the sense you just did a second ago, it, it you know cleared up. Okay, so so but but if you simply monetize that is to say, write money for people in year in this next year, that dilutes the purchasing power of everybody else. When you add more money to the system, without more without more productive power, then you're simply you're simply shifting ownership. If you see what I mean. You're shifting what people own in terms of the value of their money. If you put quite so many dollars into the system, uh, the value of existing dollars are going to go down. So right. everybody who's working. That's is, inflation, isn't that's it? That's inflation. And, it's, and, and, so, and so in some senses, money is a store of value. If you work for money it's, and you don't want to spend it now, you want to spend it later, it's a store of the value of your work. Whether it's labor work or whether it's the work of the horses, it's still a store of value. Solving the problem by simply writing money is redistributionary. It doesn't. Okay. Solving the problem by taxing the rich and giving to the poor is redistributionary. But suppose you look at that problem of not of unused capacity in the longer term, and before people get the consumer income, uh, you wait until a additional productive capacity is paid for itself. And now is earning an income by what it's producing that is distributed to its new owners. That's a different source of, of broader income. It's a broader income that is linked to additional productive capacity. Okay. It's not dilutionary. So, but, but the same unused capacity that we have today doesn't simply ex- pertain to what we make tomorrow. It also, what, what we could sell tomorrow it, it, it is very forward-looking. For example, <laughs> if you remember that, that chart for the 
one that you could download from, you know, the overview of binary economics. It's the same chart as on the overview. Um, if General Motors, if, if we encapitalize people in year eight, nine, and ten, those people are going to more autos than in ten, right? Right. Now, if General Motors, to sell more things in year eight or Pepsi, has to build a new plant, they're not going to start in year seven. They're going to probably start in year four, right? Okay. So they have to be go building. They have an investment horizon. Now, they have to get things from suppliers. Those people are, if, they, if, if suddenly they're going to have to build new, provide General Motors with more steel in year seven, year four, they're not just going to start that in year three and a half. They're going, that's a demand. So when we look at the whole economy, the promise for, for dependable consumption in year eight builds all the way back to the present. So the okay. promise of broader ownership in the future will soak up unused capacity in the present and promote more capacity. Every, I got every, it. I see what you're saying. Every every smart company is not at full capacity. They always have a cushion. Right. Or an unanticipated demand in the future. So, so you're saying that this creates another cushion for them by ensuring that their product can be afforded. It, it makes investment more secure. It makes it more secure. Yeah, but so the companies in year one, we... we we trickle, we, we move back to the, the companies in year one that may be the suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers of the people who are ultimately building consumer goods, right? They may be, you know, three, three or four links down the chain of, of what it takes for General Motors in year four to begin building a plant that will build more cars in year, for year eight. So the very beginning suppliers of supply, they have two things. They have unused capacity and they have a need to keep that unused capacity large enough, that cushion large enough to meet unexpected demand. So in year one, they're going to do two things. They're going to begin employing some of their unused capacity, which now makes their cushion of unused capacity smaller, and they're going to invest more. Right. Now, how big this is, whether it's a trickle or an avalanche, is kind of irrelevant. First of all, the first thing to recognize is it is a, is a mathematical relationship that exists that makes markets work. It could be big or small, but it's there. And the first step is to get people to understand that it's there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned with being able to deconstruct what people on the right have to say ab about capital and, and uh, these sort of things and manner of things. Because people on the left who are about redistribution and, you know, communism and things like that, like, I don't, I don't ever really see too much of... Uh, of a, you you don't you don't see a lot of uh, they have just as much poverty as anybody else, and it doesn't seem like as much gets done. Uh, at least with uh, like from the right side of the perspective, uh, they they have all kinds of concepts to get people motivated to actually you know create things and get things done. Mm -hmm. Whereas it just seems like in some of the communist countries that I've taken a look at it. There's almost like the factory workers are just letting the ceiling fall in on them, well, you know, rather than. Well, the the, the, the right wings. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I fully comprehend your question, but the, but the 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 right wing really does adopt the notion that human productivity is the engine of growth, and they broaden that to to mean to include many things. People working harder, people getting better educated, uh, the, the freedom to engage in any kind of work, the freedom to invest, the freedom from being taxed, rewards for being inventors. I mean, all the, all of that stuff is all tied up. And their their take on binary economics is to the extent. You enable people to acquire capital with the earnings of capital rather than labor. You're going to um, suppress mm. the main engine for growth, which is human productivity. Binary economist simply says, "Look, at we we're all for incentives to uh, to invest more and, and to work harder and to do all of that. But a part of that incentive is a fair field, and and the, the truth is that most capital is not in, is not acquired." By those means, right. I, 
I think what I was trying to say is, is binary economics, it seems to me, like one of these things that I would hope and, and pray almost that it doesn't get secured by either the right or the left because I don't think it is a right or a left idea. And that's what I think is one of the great things about it. It, is not, it can't be owned. It, it, this is like the law of gravity. Do you see what I'm? Do you, do you see what I'm saying though? Because if, if like people on the right, or you know, like if one, if one or the other side gets a hold of an idea, and and whether they even understand it or not, they start beating a drum around it. Then you know, the other tribe on the other side of the aisle starts going, oh, "We're not into that," just because you know people they don't like said that they are into it. Well, you know, that, you that know. Happen, but, but again, and, and you know, Ro Robert, that's a very, very important concept that he brought up because I think you yourself said that if you go to Wikipedia, you never see a correct definition of binary economics. Well, and, a, and a part of that has to do with distinguishing political agendas from the principles. Right. Um, and that's what I was trying to explain to you with, with Harold, and then I was going to give you another one. Okay. In other words, do, do you see that whether, you know, let's take tin, for example. There's only so much tin. Okay? It's as scarce as it is. I mean, it's, it's, you can call it scarce or not scarce. There's only so much tin. Right. There's only so much of this. There's only so much that. Now, if, if things are scarce or not scarce, it, that doesn't directly impinge, doesn't directly relate to the, this mechanism of growth that I've described before you, this idea that bro the broader distribution of capital acquisitions with the earnings of capital will cause growth in the way I've described, whether or not we have transcended scarcity. Okay. You see what I'm saying? No, yeah. but just a second. I, I, I gotta, I I've got to defend Harold here. I don't think that's what he means by that. I think by scarcity is transcended, I think he means that the, the technology or what you would call the, the growth of capital has now become so efficient that there's no reason for people to be shivering and cold and unhoused and hungry. That's what I, I think I, he again, means. I, 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 I think I find that to be a very absolutist statement. Let, 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 us, let us suppose just for a minute, with four, five billion people on Earth, that even if we were to implement a binary economy, in 20 years there would still some people who are shivering. That shouldn't, that, that doesn't, whether, whether that's true or false, has it, got nothing to do with the barrier to understanding this principle. It may or may not be true that we transcend it. It may be that 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 we can do. We can oh, get, you know, I, I see. What, fact, this doesn't matter. This is the, no, I see what you're saying. You're you're just saying that this has been an unconsidered principle that doesn't have anything to do with technological advancement. It's you just don't a, have to believe. If you that don't believe the technology to feed everybody to understand this principle, you don't have to engage. Right, that right, 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 right. I see that. So so, so when when it's hard enough to get people to understand that that that. <laughs> When you, when you can saw 100 boards an hour the machine saw, the machine is really doing some of the work, and it's not all you. But it's hard enough to get people to understand that. Why engage them with the idea of whether we have transcended scarcity? Yeah, I, I see what you mean, Robert, but at the same time, why are people so adverse to technology? Why do they feel almost resentful? They, because they, they can't own it. And they don't know. They don't they understand don't, that that's the They reason. don't know that. The, the, the Luddites, you know, in the last century, two centuries ago, used to break the machines. machines. Yeah, because they can't. But but again, it's in the you know the alienation here is being excluded from the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. Most people uh, who who write against who say human rights are higher than property rights say that because they're excluded from property rights. The truth of the matter is, you couldn't eat a food a piece of food if you didn't have property rights in it. Right. Freeze to death. You die. You would die without. Right. <laughs> <laughs> rights are human rights. Right. Right. I'm just saying there are these preconceptions, and one preconception is that we is that the issue that, that we must that somehow making people unquote is going to unlock some large jam. I just think it is a distraction. Yeah. A distraction. Well. Principle. But, 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 but at the same but at the same time. I don't know. I mean, I, I see what you're saying, and of course you're the, the expert here well, on this. This is my opinion. You know, so. But I, I I don't like like if. I wouldn't be side personally. I would personally be sidetracked by that because I've uh, I, I've I've been I've understood the concept of, of scarcity for a while. It was one of the first books I ever read that got my got my gears going about this was was about scarcity by by 
booked you. So, <clears throat> well, okay, maybe it's not a barrier here, but let me just make one other suggestion to you. As, as a binary economist, I distinguish between natural scarcity and unnatural scarcity, and I think it's more potent to do that. Okay. I, I, consider, I consider it to be tin, that, that metal, mm-hmm. is, is exactly as scarce as it is. You can call it abundant, or you can call it scarce, but there's a finite amount. There's of a it. finite amount. I think the fact that we cannot afford to mi- to mine tin in order to satisfy the legitimate consumer demand for tin, because it's not profitable enough to do so, an unnatural scarcity. I think it looks, it's just sharper to look at things in those ways. The, the, the unnatural scarcity is the result of concentrated ownership. Oh, I see. So you know, you're kind of saying the same thing then. I'm because looking at this be- thing, I think, in a way that doesn't cloud the issue. We only have as much tin as we have. But, 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 we, but whether we can afford to mine and process right. and create in consumer and capital goods as much tin as people have an appetite for, so, uh, it's so a me, separate issue. You're, you're, you're kind of saying, you know, someone can claim that... Uh, We've transcended scarcity, but either which way you look at it, there's only so much tin in the ground. That's right. And, and there are those, remember, there are those that believe the problem is that people have unsatiable appetites. One of the very, one of the people, and, and, that, and see, so the people on the right that, that argue against, in a sense, the need for enabling people to buy more and all that, they say, well, people are buying too much already. And, you know, they're unsatiable. No, there will always be scarcity because people never get enough. It, it's, a kind of a, it's a kind of a view of psycho- human psychology. You just, when you start arguing scarcity without recognizing the distinction between that natural and unnatural scarcity, you get into all those other arguments, all that other baggage right. that I don't think is necessary. Well, I, I, I think, and this is not this, this is kind of connected. So I, I don't think that, uh, and unfortunately this is the case, is that most people are even, this isn't even entering into the stratosphere of their, of, of their, of their mind. You know, they're not even thinking anything about this kind of stuff. Well, I can, I can tell you that, again, it depends upon who you're trying to reach. Right. And I do admit that, 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 I, that generally speaking, I try to get to, to you know, to, to decision makers and opinion leaders. I don't, I'm, I'm a real failure at that, but I try. <laughs> um, but, but, but when you try oh, I'm running to, the world someday. Uh, you, 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 you can be right there with me. When, 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 you, when you try to reach right-wing people who are, who are advising, for example, companies and banks and oil companies and things like that, and, and you know, the price of oil at, at 100 when, when you start talking about transcending scarcity, when they perceive shortages, you're not going to get very far. Right. You're just not going to get very far. Harold is not helping binary economics expand when he insists upon talking that Buck, well, you know what? Buck Mr. Fuller has proven that in January 17th, 1963, he's got a date, <laughs> we transcended scarcity. He is not helping the, 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 the people understand that the that the more broadly capital is acquired with the earnings of capital, the more we will soak up on his capacity. But, I know the man's name. I've never read a book of his, though. Yeah. Uh, but let me, let me throw something in here, though. I'm going to send you, both of you, an amazing link that I have listened to probably 15 times in the last three days. And this is about cold fusion. It's about a method of getting energy from water that would solve all of our energy problems and pollution and so on. A big Hollywood movie and, about that or something. And, no, no, listen. And it's a financial reason that this isn't done because we haven't tackled these problems where people, out of ignorance, I'm going to assume it's really out of ignorance, they don't understand that capital can pay for itself based on the earnings of future capital and it can be more productive for all of us. The whole society, everybody, the rich will be richer and the poor will come along and be wealthier, too. We'll all be richer. I, I, again, I'm going to say, I'm happy to look at your link, I, I, although I have to say that I, that I tend to limit my, I mean, I'm the only person I think who's really onto this thing in the way that I am, so I, I limit myself. I have since 1970, people, people used to go see 
Kelso who had this and that and the third solution to the energy crisis. That, and that's physics, and, and that's a whole different set of things, and, and I'm perfectly willing to believe that cold fusion is possible, but I just, as a, you know, I'm just telling you that I, that I, I don't get into that debate. That's a whole different story. And, and no, but all I was saying is when I heard Harold say scarcity's been transcended, and I sort of reverse engineered the pain of my, of my interview with him, Sure. to find out every time he interrupted me and I couldn't express what I thought. Yeah. And I looked at it and looked at it again and again and again. And then I started to realize that there's missing energy. Something is missing. Just like Aaron said to his mom, Why, what makes $5 worth $5? Somehow, there, everybody senses there's more power in this society. So why are we running around and we're all so frightened and... You know, we're not having the leisure time that we need for these kinds of discussions. Right. Well, again, my own view is that the, the most simple and elegant answer is that people cannot acquire capital with the earnings of capital. But I'm a broken record there. No, that's but, good. I hear you. And I, I'm listening to you more. I mean, I learned something. I learned a lot this session. Now, let, me, let me give one other thing or one other footnote to, the, um, uh, to this issue of teaching binary economics. Um, and, and something else that Harold said. He, he, he waxed eloquently about Gaddafi and all of that. Mm -hmm. And he said, you can't hire an employee. And he marveled at that. He thought that was wonderful. <laughs> Harold also believes, by the way, that everything should be free. And, he, and, and his, own, his own ultimate ideal has to do with you know, a non-monetary system. And I do believe, by the way, that, that as more and more people can acquire capital with the earnings of capital, their labor will be voluntary and given away, and uh, uh, that you know the the, the ideal of, of 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 providing goods and services of the type that are so good that money can't buy them uh, is very noble, and I don't argue with that at all. But it is yeah, it confuses good. things when one talks about what a political person would do if he understood binary economics and had the responsibility to run a country and what somebody and what somebody does when you're simply teaching the subject. Um, I look at it from the point of view that capital can acquire itself with the earnings of capital and soak up on your capacity and promote growth, whether or not you prohibit people from employing people. It's an entirely different issue. Right. I don't see what right. is morally wrong. Right, right, right. I mean, I'm, I'm a teacher. Right. And I don't see what's morally wrong with letting me teach at a university for a salary, assuming that uh, it's a voluntary, you know, relationship. <laughs> and that that's what I want to do. I, I, I have a capacity, and somebody else has uh, money to pay me because they've done legitimate work. I, I don't see an inherent immorality about uh, employing people. Right. And I think one confuses things when you say binary economists believe that you, you shouldn't be able to employ people. I'm going to give you a related example. My, um, my co-author, and he and I have gone different directions, uh, is very much into, Rodney Shakespeare is very much into the Islamic uh, ish implications of binary economics. And, and uh, some people in Indonesia and elsewhere. What have, do you mean? Can, can you can you be more specific uh, with with the, the Islamic? Uh, well, you know, according to Islam, you, you're not supposed to charge interest. Right, usury. You're not supposed to charge interest. Right. No. Amongst Muslims, not against, not towards a, a Jew or anybody else. Yeah, yeah according to yeah, and, and and so binary economics. You now, now when we when we in America talk about interest. There's actually two components to what we call interest, and it's important that you can you have something important to learn here. Uh, one component has to do with the risk of loss, so that if I loan, for example, money to one person who's got assets to provide a security, I can charge them one percent, certain percentage. I have to loan to somebody who's got no assets, and no capital credit insurance. I can charge a higher interest. I charge a higher interest for a riskier loan. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So the loan really has two components. One is the risk factor, and one is simply the rental of money. If you could 
imagine a riskless investment. Okay. So a purely riskless investment. So, uh, you know, you, you need to borrow money from me because you're doing a movie, and you have to show somebody with real money. Right. It's, you're you're going to give it right back. And See, I, I, again, I, I keep it like this. I, I send like a sort of, uh, like a, maybe a bit of the source of your frustration with what Harold was saying might come from what I said before about binary economics not being uh, pigeonholed into one sort of approach. Yeah, so naturally, just about anybody can get into it, but then at the same time, they might, you know, bend this or bend that. Or they add to... something or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, 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 um, those, there are those, so, so when you talk about interest, you're talking about the rental of money, and you're talking about the charging of insurance. They're two okay. different functions. Now, the, now, the Koran does not prohibit insurance. So what they prohibit is the rental of money. That's, that's, that's what is technically the interest that the Koran is prohibiting. It's not, it, they, the insurance function is not prohibited, okay? So first of all, it's nice to teach people that there's a difference between the two. Right. And the rental of money is one thing. And, and the binary economy with, with the central bank that we didn't get into because you monetize capital acquisition. You're not charging for the rental of money. So it's wonderfully clean, and it, and it creates a system where the, the Islamic world can embrace binary economics, because it doesn't require the rental of money. Good. Now, now a step further, let's suppose that you have somebody in, a, in an Islamic country, or somebody who believes in Sharia, who says, binary economics prohibits interest. It does not prohibit right. interest. It does not. It simply teaches that the broader distribution of capital acquisition will soak up on use capacity and promote growth. It's, it does not do that. It does not prohibit the in, in hiring employees. It, doesn't, it, it is a natural law. Right. It, it's all it is. It's a natural, what we're teaching is a natural law. It can be used by people who want to create a society yeah. that prohibits interest. But that's not the same thing. Now, there's another guy, and you may run into him, he's got a one, Norman Curlin, and he's got his own sort of theory of justice and, and all that. And he, he's very taken with a guiding father for a... He, he believes that the essence to binary economics is economic justice. And he, and he criticizes me by not, not, saying, not teaching the justice aspects of binary economics. The idea that capital acquires itself with the earnings of capital, does its own work, and will soak up on use capacity and promote growth. It's got nothing to do with justice. Right. It may it may seem more just to you, but I have never argued that it's important that it's that the reason we should have broader ownership is because it's just. If you believe in justice, I think this is very appealing. But you could be the king of England, want to own everything, and still begrudgingly admit because you know because the logic is there that. The broader distribution of ac capital acquisition would soak up, pro grow soak up uh, unemploy uh, unused capacity and promote growth. See what I mean? It's got nothing to do with it. Right. And I can tell you, you want a, a good way of turning off people to say, I've got the monopoly on what is justice. I mean, everybody right, thinks right, right. Yeah. So, again, it's another, I'm just teaching you that, that, that the principle here is what is at stake. And it's the principle that's not understood. We, we, we don't have a more just world because... Uh, because of, uh, I mean, I don't think that the reason that we don't have a more just world is because we have a scarcity of people who want to do justice. Right. I think we have, uh, I think we have a, a, an unjust economic world because people don't understand that capital produces wealth in the same way that labor does, and it's just and they're buying it with the earnings of capital is the way it's done, and the only efficient way it can be done, and that everybody needs some. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm, I'm just giving... No, yeah, it, it, it makes you, it, it, you pretty much, yeah, I mean, you answered, kind of answered my question when I said it, it seems to me like anybody can grab a hold of this, mm -hmm. and it looks like that, that's, we, we were almost talking, we were talking about the same thing, mm -hmm. but not quite exactly. It, 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 that's what uh, you were saying, uh, uh, Harold and, and some other uh, people have, have done, is, is they've taken it into... A direction that you don't necessarily think uh, you think is maybe a bit of a distraction. Could yeah, that be? Every idea has its own baggage, right? 
and every 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 idea will 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 if you, if you marry binary economics or join it with some other principle, you're going to get some people who say, "Well, it's wonderful because of that new principle because it's harmony with it," and other people will say, "Well, I don't like it because it's that." I mean, it, but but and that's why I don't think the idea ultimately will be co-opted by the left or the right. Right. I do think, by the way, though, that whichever political party begins to advance it. Uh, can make some gains. Uh, for the short term. How, how, like, can you can you explain that? Like, like, we'll make some gains. You mean with people uh, listening to them? Yeah. Okay. With 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 with. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, for I guess for example, um, uh, if if you if you look at the left, I mean, if I, I mean, if I were going to make an appeal to the left wing right now left wing right now, I'd say, look at, and I often say this, I'd say, look at, someone comes to your office and says, I'm hungry, I haven't eaten in two days, you feed it, that's the welfare function, function right? All right? Somebody comes to your office and say, well, I just lost my job, I've got food in the refrigerator, but I'm worried about next week and next month. Well, you help them get a job, right? Right. But that person doesn't know them to come into your office and say, you know, just the way the Rockefellers acquire capital with the earnings of capital, if I'm going to provide myself for for my family for the long term and have my children and grandchildren also have a chance in the world, I also need to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. Well, the, the left wing seems to be championing the poor and working people. And they're not, they're, 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 they're helping with the first two and they're ignoring the third. I think they'll strengthen their political message. I think they're so, uh, uh, at least in our country, it's so wrapped up in, the left-right uh, yin-yang dichotomy that they're, that, that the, the reason the left appeals to the poor is because traditionally, well, not even that traditionally, but in the past uh, 30 or 40 years, the, the left has, uh, you know, pandered, in, for lack of a better word, towards uh, a certain section of this society, and the right panders towards people that own things, and, and that's how they've just set it up for us, and that's these these when they when they you know when Obama trots out he speaks directly to a certain group of people and not to all Americans and so that's why I get so annoyed when I hear uh, politicians they all do this say uh, the American people this or the American people that and they're only speaking to the section of the American people that are that they hope vote for them they're not you're right. speaking to everybody you're right you're right but I'm just I agree I agree the left wing and the right wing and I, and my own view is that uh, is that if if you examine those in the left and those in the right that, that operate above the glass ceiling of media access, the one thing they all have in common is their net worth. Right. <laughs> yeah. Their capital, their, 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 the amount of capital they acquire with you, and that's the one thing they all have in common. Right. And again, if, if, you know, I mean, the choice, you, you were very smart to, to say, look, you know, the choice, Think about those corporations that might begin to cut in employees and others, right? Right. Uh, and consumers and all that. The real question is, once you concede that in principle the corporation will grow more if it broadens its ownership in the long run, once you concede that principle, then the existing owners have a, have a choice that it, up until now they haven't had to make because that principle is not accepted. But once you accept that principle, then the question becomes, would you as existing owners want to own a company, 100% of a company that's yay big, or let's If he can't get a good enough deal by selling his um, company to some outside buyer may end up selling